Peter, I'm ready when you're ready. We're good? I'll take the poncho off for the moment. Okay. Um, okay. Hello, everybody. Um, good afternoon. This is the Portland City Council. We are meeting at five o'clock in council chambers uh, for two workshops, two back-to-back -back workshops. The first is a workshop that will focus on uh, the development of the FY24 budget. And the second workshop will focus on um, the creation of a municipal clean elections program. So um, first we will head right into FY24 budget. I wanna thank people who are with us on Zoom this evening, um, which I do have loaded here, but it doesn't seem to be showing up on my screen. Um, oh, internet issues possibly, but um, we um, are gonna, um, we're gonna hand it right over to our director of finance, Brendan O'Connell, who's right here in chambers with us. And um, so again, first hour or so will be FY24 budget. Thanks, Brendan. Working. All right, can you guys hear me on the uh, microphone? I think uh, I've got everything rolling, but I, uh, at our last budget workshop, on January 30th, I had presented to council a list of all the budget challenges and budget opportunities that we knew about at the time with some estimated figures. And so I'm going to start tonight off by providing some updates to those figures with, in most cases, actual numbers uh, based on final estimates from the state, final uh, uh, charge numbers from the county, and what actually came through in our department requested uh, budgets. And then we'll talk through just about what inflation actually was in 2022 and look at rolling 12-month um, inflation over that same or a slightly different and more updated period. Uh, we'll talk about the tax rate impacts of varying thresholds, uh, property tax rate increases, and what that would mean to the average property owner. And then we'll actually look at what was requested by our departments and that's really our starting point for the city manager's recommended budget. So each department goes through a vetting process and vets all the requests from their various divisions and things that they do. And I'll talk about what that request was and also what our best estimate of the roll forward budget was uh, based on those requests. I'm gonna go ahead and share screen. Okay, so you'll recognize uh, the slide deck, and this was uh, what I had presented back in January with a lot of TBDs and estimated amounts in there. Now, now that we have uh, more final numbers, uh, a lot of these numbers have begun to take shape. So our pension obligation bond debt service, that number we've known, we've known it since 2021, that's set by a fixed debt repayment schedule. It's going up by $1.1 million a mill rate impact of 0.08 or 8 cents. The collective bargaining agreements and salaries and wages. I now have a more updated figure for this by, based on what's been requested by the departments, based on uh, any upgrades to positions and uh, any other contractually obligated increases. And that's 3.8 million or another 26%. The expiration of one-time general assistance funding, and this was what we talked about as probably our single biggest budget issue this year. Uh, last year, at the last minute, a potential change in general assistance reimbursement from 70% to 90% uh, did not pass. And instead, there was a compromise in which one one-time funding of approximately $10 million would be uh, divvied up amongst the communities that share the largest burden of general assistance. And Portland continues to shoulder by far the biggest burden of uh, general assistance responsibility. Our numbers of asylum seeker arrivals have continued to uh, be very large in the current year. And so this set loss of 7.4 million is the single biggest uh, budget issue in my mind and what's going to happen. Uh, because in my opinion, without additional state aid, uh, the property tax increase would just be crushing. Uh, on local property taxpayers as we try and comply with uh, the general assistance requirements from the state. This item alone represents an increase of 50 cents to the mill rate or about a 7.6% to the increase to the municipal real mill rate, 3.7% overall. The next one, reduction in FY23 to FY24 ARPA revenue of $4.75 million. 
Uh, that represents about a 5% increase to the municipal mill rate, a 32 cent increase. And then we talked a little bit at our last uh, budget workshop about the increase in sheltering costs. I had estimated uh, around four to 5 million and the final numbers are in, in sheltering co costs uh, based on department requests and operation of the new homeless services center will be an increase to the city commitment on sheltering costs of $5.4 million. So our spending from Oxford Street to the new homeless services center uh, is going up by 5.4 million. We're also gonna have some significant increases in costs at the family shelter, about a 25% increase. Uh, we've had a lot of use of uh, the overflow space and that has resulted in a lot of overtime. So we're budgeting for that next year at $658,000. So all in all, the city's commitment to sheltering is nearly doubling next year with uh, an increase of uh, about 6.05 million, 41 cent increase to the mill rate, 6.6% 6 .6 increase on the municipal side of the mill rate and 3% overall. We talked a little bit about potential revenue loss at Ocean Gateway as a result of that parking lot being reduced in size. And the department estimate from parking came in at uh, that lot potentially not being impacted until the tail end of this budget year. So the impact has gone down from around 500,000 to only around 200,000. Uh, the valuation and other changes to Cumberland County tax. So Cumberland County typically does increase our taxes each year and this year they have an increase that's close to inflation, but they're also moving from a calendar year budget to a fiscal year budget. And as a result, we're, we're having to pay that uh, one time six month costs. And we did inquire with them about whether they would be willing to let us pay that off over more than five years. And the answer was no, they felt like the interest-free option over five years was as generous as they could get. Um, so that is a $1.6 million increase. Uh, the referendum and charter changes relate to citizen initiatives. And we'll hear a little bit more about that tonight in the second half of our workshop. But there are two areas of the budget where we're seeing cost increases. One, we're seeing a need for increased headcount and permitting and inspections so we can actually comply with the requirements of some of those past referendum uh, from November. And then we're seeing some sig significant increases in the clerk's budget uh, related to additional funds and contractual services that we're gonna have to budget for. So the total is close to $600,000 uh, just for those items. Uh, one update we got earlier this month, and you may have seen my email, uh, we have seen the final or the updated revenue sharing estimates uh, for the state of Maine. And because our local, our, because our state of Maine equalized valuation increased by uh, nearly $2 billion, we are seeing a decrease in estimated revenue sharing dollars of about $1.7 million. It's a 16% decrease from year to year. So that's another uh, big uh, budget driver that's pushing uh, pushing us in terms of the tax rate increase. And then the other item on here, which um, is somewhat optional, I would say, it's not, not a, a set budget challenge in advance, was the total new FTE requests that are non-homeless services center not, uh, and non-housing or referendum related was only about $1.9 million. And in many cases, it's departments who are simply trying to build back to where they were pre-pandemic. And you know, any new position requests will obviously be heavily scrutinized in the city manager's recommended budget, but I know a lot of them are strongly supported by the manager and department heads. So um, you know, all in all, these mill rate impacts are about a buck 99 of pressure on the mill rate. Now we do have some uh, offsetting factors to this, uh, revenues going up, revenues bouncing back to pre-pandemic levels. Uh, but all in all, these total about a 14.7% impact to the, the overall mill rate. And this does not even include the other um, change related to our valuation that impacts the school side of the budget, the $2.4 million decrease to school educational subsidy, which is another 15 cents impact on the mill rate that they're struggling with on their side of the budget. So I'll just pause there because that was a lot of information on one slide and just take any Q and A on that. Thank you, Brendan. And I want to make note of the fact that we have both Councillor Ali and Councillor Zara with us on Zoom. So the council is fully present. We've just got some of us here. Oh, wait, Councillor Phillips. I don't see her on Zoom yet. 
Um, okay, so uh, to my colleagues on Zoom, just go ahead and raise your hand if you have a question. Anybody in chambers, if you've got a question at this point in time, looks like we have an opportunity to jump in. Okay. I have a quick one. Sure. Um, so you mentioned the revenues bouncing back and that's good news, of course. Um, in my mind, what that goes to is uh, less reliance on the need for ARPA funding to make up for that revenue loss that we've experienced over the last few years. So um, is, that a, is that a fair assumption that they're not bouncing up and beyond where we were necessarily, they're just decreasing our reliance on the federal funding that is time limited anyway. And I will say in some departments, we're not seeing the full bounce back to pre-pandemic levels. Most notably, the Barron Center is still well short of where they were pre-pandemic. Parks and Rec is getting close. Parking has exceeded. Uh, and then waterfront cruise ships is still not quite back to where we were. But in general, we're seeing positive trends uh, in most departments. Okay, one other quick question. Um, November 23 referendum, the charter changes where we have $600,000 here. Um, I'm assuming that's not reflective of, for example, a clean elections fund and potentially some of the uh, changes that were identified for, um, we may not need to uh, budget them in FY24, but we would over the course of FY24 as we plan for those changes. Is that right or do I have that wrong? Well, what the department's budgeted for was the full amount, I okay. believe. So you'll hear more a little bit, but I believe that does include some money for the Clean Elections Fund uh, and some software related to clean elections. It includes some new position requests in permitting and inspections specifically related to requirements of the past referendum that we are not currently doing and need to start doing based on those referendums. So. Okay. The only thing I would add is that I believe that the amount that the department has budgeted for for like clean elections has to do with what was recommended by the Charter Commission. So if the council were to increase that amount or want to increase amount, that amount of money, that is not reflected in this number, I do not believe. Okay. So just to clarify, um, Civilian Police Review Board, Ethics Commission, are those reflected in the 600? Not sure about that. We haven't uh, finished the department reviews in those specific departments, so I'm not sure. It, I don't believe that specifically the Police Citizen Review um, Board or the Ethics Commission would be included in, in departmental budgets just yet, based on my understanding of where they're coming from. But I think that um, because those require potentially the establishment first and then um, additional monies, we might have to stick an extra an extra figure in there and Brendan and I will circle back on that. So those are two things that are still hanging out there, okay. I believe. And I'm just looking back at the November 30th memo that we have staff from staff about the implementation. And so I just don't want us to lose track of that fact that we may want, because we've got two positions identified under the Civilian Police Review Board and we've got staff um, support required for the Ethics Commission. I just don't want to forget about those things. Okay, thanks. That's it for me at the moment. Councilor Tavaro. Thank you. Um, with regard to GA funding and um, revenue sharing, those two kind of state buckets, how set in stone are those in the context of the state budget at this point? So the formula for revenue changing, for, for revenue sharing is unlikely to change moving forward. What we have seen in the past is adjustments to the state's estimate of total revenue. And there are a couple of bills out there that pertain to revenue sharing, uh, one of which would change uh, the total bucket of revenue sharing up to 8%, I believe. I, I don't have high hopes for that particular one. And another one would give a municipality the option to opt into uh, revenue sharing to 10% of the sales tax collected in that municipality. And again, I think that one might be too big of an additional appropriation required at the state level. So. Now, I'm not hugely confident that we're going to get any adjustment with the exception of a potential increase to the overall pool if that happens. We have seen some significant shifts in years past. They do come out with multiple iterations of the estimate and we'll be watching. But uh, as of right now, I'm not hopeful that uh, there'll be any major other changes. And the only thing I'll add to that is that for general assistance, we have um, put forward a couple of bills and looking to increase reimbursement to 90% is one of the big significant changes. Um, not 
similarly not sure if that will get through the the legislature but we have uh we do have sponsors for that and that that will be put in front of the legislature this session uh Councilor Zaro on zoom Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, Councilor Trevorrow asked, uh, one of my questions about uh, the uh, re reaffirmation of the GA reimbursement, um, and I'll just add to what the city manager just mentioned, um, with uh, an offer, <laughs> uh, for lack of a better term, if there's anything we can do, um, Manager West, to, to help be supportive of that um, reimbursement, please uh, let the council know how to do that, um, because I know we are all very much committed to making sure that that uh, I know the slide's not in front of us, but I think that was an increase of what three, I forget what percentage was, um, the the lack there of, thank you so much, um, that one was, oh, 7.6%. Uh, 7 so that, you know, that's, that's significant. And I hope people watching this or following up on this later understand just how impactful that is. Um, and so that, that request, you know, obviously we want to be supportive of. Um, my other uh, question is, and this might happen after the department requests uh, come out, um, but I know we have the 40 position uh, addition for the full-time equivalent, mostly because of um, the Homeless Service Center. Do we know if the 260, give or take, vacant positions are going to be included uh, and rolled over in the department requests this year, or are we going to... Um, how are we going to be looking at those in context of this? So in general, we don't cut positions that the department actually needs. You know, in, in most cases, the work related to these positions has continued to get done, whether it's other people doing it on overtime or other staff, you know, just working like 10%, 20% more. But we do look at chronic vacancies and make that determination at the city manager level. You know, we obviously, if you're cutting positions, you always look at the vacant positions first, but we also look at vacant positions in terms of, does that position maybe need to be upgraded in terms of it's not competitive right now with the market. So right now, most of the role forward positions are included. I think with a few exceptions at the Barron Center, they've made some cuts based on uh, the likelihood that their census is actually gonna get back up to the level that we had it budgeted for. That's really the only place where I recall vacant positions uh, being cut. Thank you, that's helpful. And yeah, I, I mean, I understand that, you know, there's a multitude of variables uh, and that those headcounts, you know, came from years and years of hard work and, you know, obviously the significant decision to make. Um, I, I, uh, I mean, I look forward to what that actually looks like when the departments um, are sharing their uh, proposals with us in finance, um, and I think maybe just an advocacy to to look at those positions and which ones are chronically vacant, you know, versus which ones do we know we need, and if they're receiving overtime, et cetera, you know, if we can consider uh, increasing the pay of those, uh, and in you know, in doing so, being able to to really look at the the vacancies um, that we know have existed over mul multiple years. Um, that's all for me. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you, Councillor. Any other questions before Brendan proceeds? Nope, thank you. Uh, so right now, the total department request, based on what we got from the departments, is a $16.5 million increase to the mill rate. That's approximately 17% on the city side, a little over 8% overall, because we represent just under 50% of the overall mill rate. It's a buck 12 increase to the mill rate. And that's our starting point that we are going into the city manager reviews and having to reduce to get down to a city manager's recommended budget. Now, it's very difficult to determine what exactly is the rolled forward budget, but you can look through and see any new items. We have, we have some flags in there for new items, new capital items, new positions, and pulling out those was an increase that dropped that increase down to 14.8%. So that was my best estimate of what the actual rolled forward budget is. And one other thing I will note here is that the Homeless Services Center makes it difficult to look at the rolled forward budget because a big part of our increase is the move to the new operations. Um, and then department requests include a net increase in FTE of approximately 40 positions and majority of these are related to the opening of the new Homeless Services Center and past referendum requirements. We do have scattered others uh, across the departments, but uh, they're few and far between. 
So this is just an overview of what tax rate increases, overall mill rate percentage increases due to the median homeowner. I didn't even put where we're at right now on the slide because I feel like that's unacceptably high, but a tax rate increase of 10% would add $510 to uh, the median homeowner. An increase of 5% is an impact to the median homeowner of $255.19. So for every 1%, we're going up basically $50. And this is a direct result of a question that I got in one of our uh, joint city and school meetings. So I've added this to the budget frequently asked questions and answers memo, which uh, um, we have available online. So for every 1% increase, it's 50 bucks for every homeowner with a $375,000 home, which is the rough estimate I've used for a median home value. Inflation for calendar year 2022 using CPI for the Boston, Brockton, Nashua, area, which is the closest index to us, was 7.1%. It has been going down slightly uh, for the first couple months of 2023. So if you look at the most recent data for the rolling 12-month period, it is down to 6.4%, but it was as high as 8% uh, at parts of 2022 uh, for that 12-month rolling average. So this is the work that we have ahead of us. So right now, the current FY23 municipal mill rate is 653, about a $96.5 million collection that we collect from property taxpayers to fund municipal operations. Right now, the department requests have that mill rate up to 768 or about $113 million. So if we wanted to have no tax rate increase on the city side, we need to have a combination of revenue increases or expenditure redu reductions of the 16.4 million. If we want to get down to say a 5% increase, that combination of revenue increases and expenditure reductions would have to be 11.6 million. And if we wanted to get down to something closer to inflation, uh, it would be you know, between a 9.7 and a $10.6 million reduction. And you know, when I think about what it would take to make expenditure reductions, you know, I can't even imagine the level of service cuts that we would have to uh, sustain to get us there with just expenditure cuts. I mean, we would talk about major services that I know people would be up in arms about uh, having to get rid of. So I think this conversation comes back around to what can we do to work with our legislative delegation and the state to express, you know, the the burden that we're shouldering on behalf of the entire state in terms of general assistance and asylum seeker arrivals. And hopefully we can reach uh, some sort of compromise that gets us uh, a few more million dollars of funding to help us get towards this goal. So I think that was where I had left it with my updates. I know uh, we want to get into some Q&A and then I know Danielle wanted to pass along a message before we got into detailed council discussion and budget guidance. Yeah, given the time, I just want to remind everybody we only had an hour scheduled for this. So I think I would combine questions and answers with your guidance, if if that's all right with everybody. And I'll just sort of um, conclude this by saying, you know, the, it it's this is obviously going to be going to be tough. We've talked about that. There's um, a lot of a lot of things here in front of us, and so that's why I definitely need your guidance on where um, where you're comfortable with in terms of a tax rate increase. Um, it's difficult as you're putting this together to know, um, you know, where to go. Unless I I hear from you all to to see which what what you think is the the right amount um, for for the average taxpayer. Um, additionally, I think I had sent you all an email. One other piece of that that I would appreciate some guidance on is, I mean, obviously it's even if let's I'm going to take seven percent um, increase as an example. Uh, that's still going to require me to cut nine point seven million dollars out of what we have in front of us. That's 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 a lot, <laughs> and and I want to make sure I understand what your priorities are. So I would ask when you give your guidance, um, if you could also add in two or three priorities, um, whether that be core sort of municipal um, functions or uh, roles or departments or things that you're focused on, that would be really helpful for me um, as we try to get this together. And, and the last piece of that is just to remember that um, those, those 
have to do are still still exist. We still have to do all the things that the citizen initiatives and the charter changes required. Um, we still have to be able to obviously deliver certain services that we're required to do under the law. Um, so there's still some things out there that no matter what we're going to have to do. Um, and so we'll be looking to maintain those, obviously, um, and, and be able to do that moving forward. Um, and, you know, we're, I know the legislative committee is working pretty extensively to try to work on some of the legislative fixes that could help us as well to find and plug those revenue holes and um, staff and myself included will continue to, to help them do that. But just know that I, I really just need you to, to drill down on that guidance just about what that increase would be for you and then those two or three priorities. So uh, thank you. And we're here if you have any questions. Okay, great. Thank you for that context. So I want to look to my colleagues on the council, both in chambers and on Zoom, um, to, like I said, we're I think we're rolling up any any remaining questions from the presentation and the guidance that we know that we've been asked to give this evening. Um, and you know, I'm always tempted to ask ten questions, but I realize that we do have upcoming finance committee meetings <laughs> that we can do that at. So. Um, I will do my best to summarize questions. Okay, so I'll break the ice, how about, um, and offer some thoughts that, that I've got. So I think these are, um, these are pretty sobering numbers uh, to know that the roll forward budget uh, represents an increase of 14.8%, I think is really significant. That Thank you, Brendan, for that. I was wondering, okay, so we've got, you know, sort of the aspirational, uh, the, the, the delta between aspirational and roll forward is um, not that big. So that's really significant. So to the city manager's question about uh, core municipal services, I know that, um, I'll just say that it, it, it's, it strikes me being at City Hall a lot uh, over these past few years, the importance that um, it's so important that we get staff in place, um, that we are hiring permanent staff people where we currently have interims. And that's, um, I feel like we're, we're hitting that place from the pandemic years where we've, for a variety of reasons, we've been unable to um, to really fill positions permanently. And we're, we're, we're hitting right into that place right now. And so as we head into FY24, I think that replacing that staff capacity um, or filling the, the capacity in a permanent way, um, both at the city manager level and corp council level, but also throughout departments, um, uh, leadership in that way. Um, so making sure that we've got, you know, those key staff positions filled, um, I'm thinking about, you know, economic development and uh, various departments that have um, that need. So um, that feels really uh, important to me. Um, I just lost a train of thought that I had. Um, you know, as I've been thinking about uh, overall impact to taxpayers, and we've started to get some feedback from people in the community, um, the the time that we're in right now feels precarious and yet not wholly unfamiliar. Um, where we've got inflation, we've got a lot of things happening out in the world that are impacting people's sense of job security, um, banking security, uh, just you know the everyday reality of inflation, whether it's putting gas in your car or having heating oil delivered or groceries um, in your cart. So I think that the the fact of inflation is a real, uh, it, it's, a, it's a context piece that we need to pay attention to. So as we've kind of over the last couple of months contemplated the, um, the budget, I've thought, I think we need to be below the rate of inflation. Um, I know we've, we've got some, you know, we've got somewhere between, I think it's 6.4 and 7.1. Um, as that rate, I mean, I, I was I was coming in here tonight thinking um, I'd be more comfortable at five percent, um, which probably, as we look at the historical trends, is not an insignificant increase year over year when we contemplate the municipal budget. Um, the frequently asked questions that's in tonight's packet and that constantly gets updated, I think, is a great place for us all to 
direct our question. So I actually have directed that question to our director of finance so that we can look at the year over year budgets in terms of um, you know, percent increase as we go from year to year. So on page two of the FAQs, we can see a lot of information about the breakdown between municipal portion, school portion, tax levy. But I think looking at the overall budget uh, year over year um, is is important to me, and um, and and that's the thing that I think drives the the question of how much are we asking our local taxpayers to to increase um, the revenues that go to support both the city side and the school side. Um, so so yeah, I guess I'll, I mean, the other thing is like you said, um, city manager, there's there's a lot of non-negotiables heading into this budget. We I'm looking at this page right here in tonight's packet that talks about an increase of approximately 40 new positions. So it'll be interesting as we move through this to understand those positions and how, and how they break down uh, between homeless services center and the referendum requirements. And I know it's not just the charter, Commission amendments. It's the referendums from November that, and and maybe even some carry forward from the November 2020 stuff. Where I know that we've got some um, capacity in various departments that are needed to support um, the 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 work of of those uh, ordinance amendments that we've seen um, as well. So um, I'll ask that question more formally as we move through this. But um, some of the I think flexibility that past councils may have had. Um, uh, I think has been, um, you know, our, our focus right now is making sure that we do what we have to do based on the voter approvals that we've seen lately. Councilor Dion. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I, I wanna have some random thoughts, so they're not in any order of priority, but I wanna make sure I get them out there. There's been a tradition in the council, at least in the relationship with the manager. Um, while I've been in office, uh, the manager solicits a conversation with each of us uh, to determine what we consider to be a priority in our district for consideration or budget. Uh, before coming to council chambers this evening, I saw her in her office and I told her I have no such list. In good faith, I can't carve out an individual agenda for District 5 when my primary concern is whether or not we have a budget that makes sense for the whole city. Maybe another cycle, another day, I'd have the luxury to advance that kind of proposition with my constituents, but today I feel more compelled to protect their economic interests in terms of how we define our relationships via property tax. I too, in, in prior conversations with some of you, I'm gonna fall down on 5%. Uh, it's a place to start the conversation. Uh, and I think what haunts me, and that's probably not the right word, but it's working right now, is that's half the number. I don't know where we're gonna get to in working with uh, our counterparts, the Board of Education, uh, I'm encouraged by our first steps at collaboration at looking at the budgets. And at least in one media report, they've suggested 9% increase. So there's work to be done there, but whatever consequence comes from the final budget document is what I'm concerned about. And we only have half that picture. In terms of vacancies, uh, I would hope to discover from the manager's office at some point the distribution of those vacancies are we are a lot of those from the Barron Center, and then the ancillary numbers come from uh, departments. It's important to know that because I think a good administrator has to question how valid a particular service strategy remains if you can't staff the positions to get the job done. Maybe that mission has to be shelved or reconsidered or reconfigured to the reality that we find ourselves in today. It was nice what we did before pandemic, but we're in a different place now. And it's required new thinking about how we deliver services. So when I look at the budget moving forward, we've talked about this concept of what are core services. This is my own individual opinion, of course, but 
I think our first responsibility as a municipal government is to keep people safe. So our resources as they involve public safety, whether it's MedQ, the fire service, police, um, we should make sure that they're adequately funded or staffed to meet the demand that the public has long come to expect from those components of city government. I mean, that's, I have led law enforcement outside of the city and they, they were having response times that I knew would never be tolerated by the residents of Portland. And um, I think it's in our best interest that we maintain that level of service. Uh, the next core department that I pay particular attention to uh, is public works. I think the, the second role of municipal government is to make sure people can go about their business uh, in the city. Uh, and I don't mean that necessarily economically, but just to be able to move about freely. The roads are paved, uh, sidewalks are maintained, um, the streets are plowed. And we saw in a recent uh, snowstorm, um, there was a delay in some parts of the city uh, because although the, the manager and others had been pretty public facing about their discussions of reduction of staff at DPW, I don't think it resonated with everyone till they saw the snow was there much longer than they experienced in the past. So I would wanna make sure to focus on that. And um, I, I told one constituent, my, my street was almost 12 hours before they got to it. And I knew exactly why it happened. And he was honestly um, unaware of the challenges we were facing at DPW. So those, those to me are the core services. I mean, I am a big advocate for recreation. Uh, I'm a big advocate for health and human services and more so around our, what we're doing for the unhoused. But those are the second ring of what I think are core services to begin with. So, and I'll close with this. I think a lot of our families our individuals, our seniors, those who live on fixed income. This inflationary spiral or hill that we've been climbing has, it's made them feel unsafe. I mean, these are economic threats that make people psychologically anxious, okay? Because then they're faced, they're forced to make really hard choices. We have to make hard choices. In so far, and I'll close with this. Uh, that's the constituency that I will continue to advocate for is I, I don't want to continue to press some theory about their capacity to continue paying upwards as far as their property tax is concerned. And I, I was saying I was going to close and I will with a comment on general assistance and other revenue streams from Augusta. I think it's in our best interest that we lobby, advocate, mm -hmm. arm twist, whatever is acceptable to get them to make the right decision. But I would welcome those monies as a windfall. That I would like to think that we did our hard work and things that we had to say no to, suspend, retract, or constrain were subsequently refinanced because of the state windfall. But I think it's incumbent on this council and hopefully joined by others around this horseshoe that we need to give a hard number to the executive so that she can build her budget and we can see where the results are. As I said, 5% is my start number. Let's see what it looks like. I mean, I'm simple. I, I think if I go to my neighbor and say, look, five to a thousand dollars more next year, it's not going to be well, it's not going to be welcome because other things are, are happening. I mean, so I'm going to close with that because, as I said, I, I can be guilty of ambling along some vocal highway. I love to hear myself speak, I guess, is my sin. Thank you very much, Madam Mayor. <laughs> Thank you, Councillor Diane. We are recording. <laughs> um... If, if I look right at you, right? Councillor Fournier. <laughs> Thank you. 
Um, I don't really have a whole lot of um, polished words. I think a lot of this is still sinking in. Um, and so I think just what I will share is, um, you know, we, my own household is a household of six and our, you know, adult sons still live with us because they can't afford to go out and rent um, any place. And so anytime I'm looking at increases to our property taxes, I'm thinking about how that's going to affect our household budget and how we're going to afford, you know, making sure that groceries happen or that we can afford the CMP rate hikes that keep going up or keeping oil come in. And so I'm, I'm very mindful of and we'll feel this <laughs> directly with whatever uh, we settle on. And so um, understanding and thinking about where we've been in the past. I know last year we were considering, well, zero to five would be great, five being the high mark. And this year it's like, wow, anything below five just seems unattainable without cutting some significant services. And so coming in, um, as we uh, reviewed this last time and reviewed, um, the materials before today, I think I'm in the place of, I would love five to be where we could be also understanding the rate of inflation is higher than that. And so looking at what we would have to cut may be a little bit painful. So I am more of a range um, similar to Councillor Diane, where five is a good starting point, um, but I would like to keep it below the rate of inflation. So really between five and 7% would be ideal for where I'm coming in still understanding that's um, a hard number to get to, as well as the services we have to consider um, would be really, really uh, challenged. Um, just a couple of additional thoughts um, that I had um, just to, to close this out is um, anytime we've had to do budgeting in any um, organization that I've worked at, um, and I hate the word <laughs> efficiency review because I think it's terrible, but I do think, you know, that's one of the places that I would say as we're doing these department budgets, and I'm sure this is something that's, you know, happened along the way, but if we've had similar also to what Councillor Diane said, if we've had open positions for a number of years or for a long period of time, how can we reorganize that department or reorganize the services that are provided? What are the things that we absolutely have to do at least until we're able to get things under control? Um, and that feels very challenging, um, but if I'm having to look at my own budget, there are sometimes the nice to haves that I can't have um, if I don't have the money coming in. Um, of course, as a member of the legislative committee, we are looking at all of the legislative um, solutions that are hoping, <laughs> hoping, not guaranteed to happen, but that we're hoping will happen. Um, but again, that's not guaranteed money coming in. So I think we need to make the plan based on what we have and what is guaranteed money. And if the additional comes in, then great. That's when we can start to budget for the nice to haves rather than the, what we have to provide. Um, so I think the, the last thing that I'll close with is looking at our council goals. And I, I pulled them back up just as a reminder for me um, that when we talked about everything that we do this year, we're using always using a lens that prioritizes racial, social, and justice equity. And of course, we want to focus on housing, homelessness, climate, and sustainability. But I think as we're making these decisions on what needs to be moved or changed, um, increased or decreased, um, that we are sidewalks. You know, there is absolutely a social justice and racial justice and equity issue there. And so making sure that we're keeping those um, things as our frame uh, as we're doing that work. Um, so I don't know that I <laughs> really was very helpful outside of um, really trying to keep it between that five to 7%, understanding how this impacts my you know, household budget, what that's going to feel like, and that it's really, really, really challenging uh, when I see so many others struggling and we're trying to prevent foreclosures and we're trying to prevent evictions and we're trying to keep people where they can age in place. And I wanna make sure um, that that commitment is something that we're really trying to uphold as we work on housing, homelessness, climate and sustainability. So thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Rodriguez, and then Councillor Tavaro. Thank you. Um, so, um, we're, I, my sense is that we're probably all going to land within a certain kind of friendly range that's already been discussed. Um, I'll, I'll, what I'm going to say is probably going to land somewhere around what we've already heard. Um, so, kind of the disclaimer that I'd like to give so that there's no surprises. Um, 
I, I did in in how we look. By the way, like guidance for the increase um, is also, I guess, guidance to us for like the appetite of what we need to discuss for cuts. So that five to ten percent, five five to ten, excuse me, five to seven percent gives us a, like between nine and eleven mil worth of reductions that need to be identified. So that's frightening to begin with, um, particularly with the next discussion of um, core services. Um, there aren't going to be any big surprises. I think I, perhaps there will be some big surprises of what we identify as core services. Um, but I do want to, in case it's lost and it could, when we give you know this context, it could be. Um, I do want to say that the schools are a core services, um, and clearly when we talk about not just the educational piece, but remember that our schools feed a lot of our students and families who are experiencing food insecurity. It's one of some of the places that many of our kids finally um, can have a safe um, spot to, uh, to be. Uh, and of course, they do so much more than just, you know, provide education, which is why, you know, clearly during the pandemic, shutting them down was a lot more complicated than just, you know, moving to like remote classes, you know, the services that go along with that. So schools are, are certainly to be considered high on my list of core services. And clearly that's the piece that we have the least influence on. Actually, no, we have quite a bit of influence, but it's a piece that in, in today's discussion, we're not able to have a lot of context to guide us with. Um, Councilor, I just wanna add one quick thing on that. Um, just would know we have joint finance committee meetings coming up, so we will have more discussion on that. And specifically, we'll also be looking at the audit too, which impacts both the schools and the city. So I think that those future meetings, which are all in the city calendar would be helpful. Absolutely, definitely. And in the context of like the guidance tonight, it might not necessarily, we don't have it available, but certainly I know that we will through the, through the development process. Um, the next piece I guess I wanted to talk about was um, when we look at, Brandon, this is more, I guess, um, on, in your area. When we look at the increases that contractual obligations that we have year over year, um, I also worry about creating like a huge gap next year. So like if we're really conservative and increase this year, but we have the contractual obligations next year, then like fair to say that then we have to make up a bigger difference. Um, so in, with that in mind, I guess, and, and acknowledging how difficult it is to see the year over year budgets, um, it'd be helpful to get some idea of what we're looking at for like FY25. And I don't know how much further you feel comfortable giving us some sort of guidance. I guess to, to avoid that huge gap of like, if we don't make a big enough increase this year. Um, and hopefully knowing what the Homeless Services serve, uh, Center will, will have will help us develop you know, the year over year versus what it was like this time looking at last year. And then the last thing in terms of guidance for us to make decisions, when we look at the um, open positions, I don't know if this is helpful, but when I think of a budget, um, particularly for like a business, not necessarily not a municipality, um, when I look at the salaries or payroll um, expenses, you know, we we classify them separately, right? Like you have the wages that are in your cost of goods sold, and you have your wages that are part of your operational expenses. So in the city's operational budget, when I think of the wages that are on the cost of goods sold, those are kind of like your programs and services versus your you know overhead expenses, your overhead wages are you know, the people that work in the offices and in Canco Road and such. Um, so I don't know if that helps us, but kind of given that differentiation to me, at least, um, when I look at the nine to 11 mil um, worth of reductions, um, you know, clearly wages uh, or rather uh, FTEs will be considered there. So that'd be one layer that might help me differentiate it. And I wonder, if that, does that weigh differently in the budget? The two, oh no, right? Because the over the labor burden is the same regardless. So, well, we have a separate part of the budget that is fringe benefits, uh, and then we have salaries and wages and overtime in the in the payroll part of the budget. But we do have a good handle, and we'll go through that in detail at the finance committee about which contracts have recently settled. Many of those did include you know, market wage adjustments, but we do have other ones that uh, still have yet to have any market uh, wage adjustments. So we'll be highlighting all of that. Perfect. Yeah. Excellent. And I think that's, yeah, I guess if I wasn't clear earlier, the five to 7% range is what I think would get us into the conversation that I believe needs to be had, which gets us between nine and 11 million worth of reductions to identify it. Um, that's all, thank you. I hope that's helpful. Thank you, Councillor. Next to you, Councillor Trevaro, and then we'll go to Councillor Pelletier. Thank you, Mayor. Um, 
So I, I don't know how you find $10 million. Like I, this is, I've, you know, I have eight years experience on the finance committee for the schools plus one on the finance committee here. And I've never seen anything. I think four and a half was like the biggest deficit that I've ever seen. And I recall how challenging it was to find that. And so, you know, just looking at this, I, I don't, I don't know how we get to a 5% increase, to be honest. I, I think I would probably be more in the range of a of seven, which still puts us having to find $9 million. Um, I have a couple of questions. I was wondering, um, could you talk about the criteria for the program that we have for seniors um, to be able to get a rebate um, based on their income and their housing expense? So are you talking about the existing peace debt program or the upcoming program that would freeze property taxes for seniors? I was talking about the one in existence, but act, but maybe maybe you could talk about both. So there is a state program which allows a rebate of up to $1,200 for seniors who meet certain income criteria. And the city will match the full amount of that credit with our own local program. We currently have about 200 people who have qualified for that program. And anyone who has qualified in the past automatically receives uh, a renewal. But we did, you know, when this pro program first came out, reach out with a mailer to everybody. And we really tried to get people signed up for that program. So you know, that's one good opportunity for low income seniors in our city. Uh, and it's actually age 62 or below. Not, uh, I know the definition of seniors uh, might be different amongst certain things, but it's age 62 or below. And uh, it's a rebate of up to $1,200 at the state level, up to $1,200 at the municipal level as well. And what's the ratio for income to housing expense that qualifies them? I don't know that one off the top of my head. It changes each year at the state level. So they just simply have to send in their qualification form. Uh, we'll put that in the Okay. Budget free and theoretically, I mean, if we raise taxes, it could potentially push more people into that category so that they, they could qualify for that where they hadn't before. Potentially. Okay. Have we ever looked at, um, done any projections about expanding that program to either include people um, just purely based on income without the age restriction or any other kind of deviations? We haven't uh, looked at the uh, criteria, but we did look at increasing the amounts and so what it would do when we increase the amounts in the past. Okay. So we have some of those projections. Okay. It might be, I don't know. I, I think it might be worthwhile to kind of look at, just look at what um, might be opportunities in this because I, I just feel like our, um, you know, historically we have not raise taxes to the rate of inflation. And to me, um, that means that we're never fully supporting our needs, you know, for, for the city budget. You know, we're like the one budget that doesn't grow with inflation, you know, so um, we're consistently having to find areas to, to trim. And it's really getting to a point where, um, I mean, it's, I think we've kind of snowballed to a point where like we really need to capture revenue um and so i'm interested in just kind of looking at what something like that might look like to be able to protect the people that we want to protect while also being able to capture uh revenue that's needed so um that was one question i guess the other question i'm wondering is if we have any or if there is published anywhere objective data to give us a sense of really economically how Portland residents are doing. I mean, I know we, you know, we have medium, median household income, but do we have any further breakdown that would let us know, like, really, what is our residents capacity to afford? That's really the only data that you know, I'm aware of. We actually include that data in our financial statements uh, by year. Um, so that's the one I have, but I can certainly uh, look in to see if we have any other more in-depth data. Thank you. Um, yeah, so I think those were my questions as far as guidance. I, you know, I, you know, I think my colleagues know that I'm typically on the higher level of tolerance, and I would, um, I would go with somewhere around a seven percent, probably. Um, is there anything I wanted to say? 
Yeah, I think it, as far as, you know, what our core services, I think they've been outlined well by my colleagues, um, Councillor Dion, you know, um, safety and public works. I think that the key to our goals is really that they're embedded within our core services, that, um, you know, the, the policies within our departments are equitable policies. And um, so I think that, you know, they're not necessarily like one or the other. We're not pulling away from equity to get to core services, but really that we're implementing them through our core services. Um, and I guess the only thing I would flag as a core service maybe to add on to that is, um, that park, the parks department really does a lot of work cleaning up the parks. Um, and I think that's very, very sorely needed. Um, you know, the, the trash that accumulates as soon as it's picked up um, is really, you know, it, it's a challenge to keep up with for sure. So, and I hear from that, hear that a lot from constituents. I think it's a, you know, an issue of sanitary and everything. So I guess that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. And next to you, Councillor Pelletier. Thank you. Um, yeah, I don't I don't know how much more I have to add in terms of my colleagues saying it all. Um, you know, I, I feel like five to seven feels like a starting point for me. And I'm I feel like I'm in a similar boat than everybody else. Um, you know, and as a renter, I may be the only renter here. Um, you know, that's a significant concern as well, because those costs will ultimately in, in many ways be passed to, to the renters. Um, so I'm thinking about that. Um, and I'm thinking about like a five to seven percentage is still between what 11 and $9 million in, in reductions. And so it's hard thinking about the core services component of it, because you know, I understand what everyone has been saying about our goals that will be embedded into the core services. We will make sure that there is equity within the core services. Um, but it, I mean, it's hard to to balance and quantify because our our current progress, our current in progress racial equity department is a core service for me, and our parks and rec department is a is a core service for me, and our sustainability department is a core service for me. And I think it, it's it's tough because we all have different ideas based on our different experiences of what is a core service. And I often think at times with the, the discussion in terms of human rights and the alignment with racial and social impacts, um, a lot of these things that I think we're trying to do and the things that we talked about in our goal setting workshop, I, I'm concerned that the, the goals that we have won't have a chance to thrive and won't really have a chance to make it off the ground based on some of these determination determinations that we're going to make of the budget. So Again, I'm just concerned that even with these percentages, there's going to be significant cuts to the things that we prioritize. And I also just want to put a plug in that I know it's not according to how we normally do things, but I think it would be great to move our goal setting workshop to after this conversation with the budget, maybe next year, because I feel like we get all jazzed up about setting our goals and then we are hit with like a heavy dose of reality. <laughs> I know everyone's just like looking at the floor, <laughs> like, <laughs> but um, it's, I mean, it's hard because we get really excited and then we, we have this conversation and then it's a little bit like, okay, we need to change gears or at least figure out what we're able to do. Um, and then, you know, I haven't even talked about the overwhelming amount of vacancies that we have at the city level. And I don't know if that number was shared or how many vacancies we currently have. Is that a number that you have off the top of your head? So that's a, also in my budget, frequently asked questions and answers memo, it's around 256 yeah. for our last count. They calculated it at some point in February. So okay. hopefully that's down a little bit. Yeah. Up a little bit. So right. Yeah. But it's, you know, 250 vacancies that we have. And so it's like, you know, we also need staff to be able to do the things that we want to do. Um, and then I, I th this was mentioned as well. I'm concerned that if we are really conservative with the budget, there will be a gap next year and a trend will will start as well with, with being conservative and not allowing the things that we have prioritized to have a chance to take shape, um, which take time. It's going to take years for the things that we want in terms of racial equity, in terms of, of social equity, um, and aligning again with our with our goals that we, we listed at the December workshop. So um, 
Yeah, I mean, I I don't know that I have a ton more to add. And I again, I think that we can talk about five to seven percent as a starting point, but that's again, it's still such a large reduction. And I I just don't. I got, I'm just kind of wondering where where that will come from and where that will leave us afterwards for the things that we really have said that we want to do at the beginning of the year. So, yeah, that's kind of my my um, current mindset at this point. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. And we've got Councillor Ali on Zoom. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, uh, Mayor, and uh, thank you, everyone, for your input. Um, <clears throat> oh, there's two of me. Um, much have been said uh, about what can be cut or where people feel comfortable. I will begin by saying that I think uh, five to seven is um, a good start, a good place to start. I also think uh, 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 it's going to be difficult for us uh, to look at all the services that we provide, uh, because I believe um, as one councillor that um, the role of any municipal government is uh, uh, everything that we provide, uh, whether it is from uh, public safety, uh, uh, the quality of life uh, that um, we provide to residents of our city, our parks, education department, and every aspect of what we do is uh, uh, a core service um, uh, component of what we do. And uh, uh, none, in my opinion, is uh, more important than the other. Uh, and uh, uh, whereby uh, we are at a situation where we have to pick and choose what we will uh, fully fund and what we may not be able to, even though we wish we could. I will be more comfortable trimming uh, um, almost every aspect of the service that we provide than fully funding one aspect and cutting overwhelmingly, uh, 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 cutting um, other services. So I will encourage my colleagues uh, at the finance committee uh, to uh, all, a, all the full council to look at how can we spread the pain um, uh, throughout our uh, departments instead of fully funding one aspect of uh, uh, what we see as core service and overwhelmingly um, <clears throat> cutting or significantly uh, cutting, um, um, taking away from another department. I think uh, uh, we are capable of creatively looking at uh, uh, trimming a little bit um, uh, from almost everyone uh, to get to where we are and then uh, painfully uh, reduce some of the service, every service uh, a little bit um, across every department or every aspect of uh, uh, the service that we provide the city. Uh, thank you. And as I said, I am open to having this conversation and uh, anything between five to seven um, uh, is comfortable with, with me to start from. So thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Ali. Next, we go to Councillor Zaro. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, it, it, it's really hard for me uh, to assign two or three priorities uh, in this context. You know, we are a municipality that is notorious uh, for punching above its weight class. Uh, as many of the folks listening to this conversation and others know, like we do far more than core city services when compared to neighboring towns. Um, and even in the region uh, of Northern New England, we are known as a city who cares. We show that in our budget every year uh, as it's the document that does guide us. Um, so for me, that's actually why this is really challenging, um, you know, in practice versus, you know, when we're just kind of talking about preparing for giving advice, um, you know, what is fair uh, when we're giving a general guideline for a percent increase this this at this stage in the budget process, you know, after the this presentation and the discussions that I've had with city staff, I honestly think a 5% increase is a best case scenario uh, at this point. Um, I know we have a long road ahead of us on budget work, and I want to be mindful that we're focusing on city services that we are responsible for delivering to constituents. And I, I think I've heard that from most of our colleagues tonight. People look to the city council for trash pickup, filling potholes, keeping the streets 
you know, easy to navigate, ensuring that streetlights are kept on, uh, and you know, ensuring the city is safe. We see that, we hear that all the time as a district councilor. I feel like, you know, district councilors hear that all the time as, as we are the most constituent facing. Um, you know, people want a city that they can be proud of. And I think a lot of that is objective, um, but the core services that we are tasked with stewarding are what most constituents, I think, um, I think that's what they're thinking about at night when they're worried about their finances and balancing their checkbook. They're thinking about what they're getting out of their city when it comes to core services, when they're, when they're wondering where their tax dollars are going. Um, for me, I can speak, and as many of you know, sustainability initiatives are my top priority for the most part, but also I believe that return on investment is obvious and exponential. Um, that's just my opinion, but I know everyone has their own. Uh, again, we're a city that cares deeply. Any cut that we make to our budget is going to hurt, but I look forward to working with the city manager and the finance committee uh, in this work um, over the next couple of months. But to sum it all up, I, you know, I, I will agree with my colleagues, 5% is a good place to start. I, I do think that's the best case scenario at this point. Um, but I look forward to working with all of you. Thanks. Thank you, Councillor Zaro. That's okay. That's life. It's all right. Um, okay. W thank you, everybody, for providing guidance and feedback and um, some input. I want to hand it over to the city manager as we, before we segue into our next subject to, to wrap this portion up. I really do appreciate all of your thoughts um, and we will be, you know, following up, like I said, with the finance committee and really looking deeper at the school's um, budget as well and understanding that this is going to be a balance. I think a balance across the board um, with with them as well and trying to understand the impacts of that. Um, and we'll be doing that work with the finance committee. Additionally, Brendan and I have, I noticed my calendar is pretty full for the next month or so where we'll be diving in uh, pretty deep with our uh, leadership team to, to look at budgets and ways in which we can try to deliver what um, and meet the, the needs that you just articulated. So we will do our best. Um, it's going to be tough. There's no doubt about that, but I do appreciate your thoughts tonight. Thank you. Um, thank you. Um, and Brendan, do you have anything you want to say before we wrap this up? Okay, I think the, the next finance committee meeting is on March 28th. It's a joint finance meeting committee meeting with the city's finance count, uh, committee and the school's finance committee. So uh, March 28th, five o'clock um, on Zoom, not, uh, not five o'clock. Thank you, joint. Oh, so five o'clock city council finance committee. And then starting at 6.30, we'll be meeting jointly with the schools. 6.30 is the start of the joint meeting and on Zoom. Okay, great. Okay, thanks everybody. So we're just, uh, we're making pretty good time, I would say, um, as it goes. It's 11 minutes after six. We're gonna switch into our next workshop this evening, which is um, a workshop to discuss the creation of a municipal clean elections program. Um, I'm going to get my packet for that. Um, so, uh, I know that um, we have attorney Katsafikas with us this evening, and um, Jim, I think I'm going to look to you and um, your colleague uh, from Perkins Thompson, Brandon Mazur, and Emily Arvizu, how'd I do, um, for an introduction. But before I do that, I'd just like to lay out the, the, the plan for the next um, little bit of time. So we're going to get an introduction um, from folks who supported the work of the Charter Commission. Thank you for being here and thank you for offering that to us. Then we're gonna go into a public comment period. And we built, we uncharacteristically built this into the workshop session tonight because we wanted to make sure to get feedback at this stage of the game, um, which again, we don't always do when it's a workshop, but we built that in tonight, um, believing that that's important. We will have public comment when the council takes action as well. So there will be that opportunity. Um, so what we've done is we've limited the co public comment period tonight to 60 minutes. I don't know if we'll get there or if we'll need the full 60 minutes, but the reason we did that was just to um, 
you know, kind of keep track of our time, be respectful of everybody's time uh, this evening, and also note that um, this isn't your only opportunity for public comment. And of course, between now and when we take action on a municipal clean elections program, we do encourage people to submit public comment in writing. Um, so that's always possible. And I noticed in our packet tonight, we've got some published um, public comment already. So uh, if you're if you're unable to speak to us tonight during the public comment portion, please um, submit uh, your your thoughts in writing and know that in the future we'll have other opportunities for public comment um, as the council looks to take action. And so after the public comment period, we're going to talk about um, the uh, Maine's clean election law as an example. We're going to talk through that uh, a little bit. Um, and so again, this is kind of night number one with regard to municipal clean elections. And with that, Jim, thank you so much for being here and I'll hand it over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Snyder, members of the council. Uh, my name is Jim Katsafikas. I'm with the law firm of Perkins Thompson. And as you heard, two of my colleagues are here tonight who have been working on this with me, uh, Brandon Mazur and Emily Arvizu. And so we're going to split this up. We're going to be efficient because we know you have a lot on your plate and we don't want to waste any time here. Last November, as you know, the uh, the Charter Commission acted and, and brought uh, a measure before the voters, which the voters passed. That was question three. And it directed the city to establish a clean elections fund. And it has to be available for this election cycle. So that means by July 1 of this year, we have to be up and running to make sure this is ready for November 2023. Candidate participation in this clean election program is voluntary. But uh, we need to have the program in place. And under the charter, that clean election fund must limit the amount of funds a participating candidate can raise. It has to be limited to candidates who meet certain requirements. They sign a, a, a form that will say that they intend to participate in this clean elections program, that they agree to participate in a voter event, a voter education event, or a city-sponsored forum. And all unused funds will come back and go back into the clean election fund for future use. That question three also included some campaign finance rules, one of them being a prohibition on business entity contributions to any candidate for public office, prohibition on ballot questions or expenditures from any entity that's substantially under foreign influence. And both of those are on state in the State Clean Elections Act and just added this year, but they were added as well to Portland's ordinance. And then that the city clerk create a searchable online database using information from registration and campaign finance reports. So we've been asked to help the city with this task uh, to implement the charter revision by drafting a clean election ordinance. To do that, we wanted to make sure it's something that can be efficiently implemented and be comprehensive enough to, to get in place for this year. We've met with the city clerk, we've met with the elections administrator, we've reviewed the recommendations of the main citizens for clean elections. I believe you've all received their memorandum from earlier this year. And both really recommend starting with Maine's clean election law as a starting place. We're all familiar with it. Candidates are familiar with it. Uh, it's something we can use as a, as a basis, and then in, it can be changed on an iterative basis as we see how that works. There are some differences, though, between state elections and municipal elections that we have to pay attention to. The, for the state races, uh, if you are running for the legislature, you begin to get your uh, nomination papers available in January. Here it's June 15. There are primaries at the state level. We don't have that here. So there are some differences, and there's actually a very compressed election schedule here. We have 127 days for an election under Portland's uh, charter. So it's it's a little challenging, and so we've uh, but we've started with that state clean the elections act, act as a basis. basis. We've, we've also, also looked at that's okay. I'm, I was echoing a little bit. Sorry. We, we've also looked at other ordinances uh, in other communities that have implemented a similar type of system. We've looked at Seattle, as was suggested, and we've looked at Santa Fe, New Mexico. And Brandon will talk about the features of those uh, different ordinances. But we're primarily drawing from the Maine Clean Election Act and the Santa Fe ordinance. We've outlined some basic concepts. Emily will take us through those. And we want to make sure that they mesh with the city's elections timeline so that the clean election program and the uh, and the normal election program can be administered together with decent administrative efficiency. 
And so uh, Brandon will show us a timeline as to how these might be coordinated so that state and city election law could, could be uh, easily implemented. We recommend that these clean election program be Article 5 in uh, Chapter 9 to the city ordinances, and then these new election finance rules uh, can go in as Article 6. Following the presentations, we know there'll be an opportunity for questions, for comments, input from the council, from the public. We look forward to that. With that input, we'll be back here in two weeks uh, for a second workshop. We can talk about some of these details uh, and a proposed ordinance at that point, and that would allow for first and second readings. We hope during the month of April so that this can be up and running and candidates can think about whether they want to be participating candidates in advance of when nomination papers are available in June. With that, I'll be quiet and turn this over to, to Brandon and to Emily. Thank you. Thank you. And while you're switching spots, I'll just um, flag what you just said, Jim, which is we have a second scheduled workshop on clean elections on Monday the 27th, so two weeks from today. We'll be back here. We'll have a little more content that we're able to respond to, and it'll be really a working session for the council. Excellent. Um, good evening, uh, Mayor Snyder, members of the council, Brandon Mazur here to follow up with Jim. Um, a little bit of technology, uh, being in person is uh, always a challenge uh, other than being in Zoom. Um, so as, as uh, Jim just went through why we're here, uh, the charter revision uh, required that. So I'm, I'm gonna skip through this slide. Um, scope of our review. Um, as Jim alluded to, we looked at sort of three worlds. We looked at uh, the current uh, Maine Clean Elections Act and the associated rules. We looked at the Santa Fe Public uh, Campaign Finance Code and Honest Election Seattle. And I'm gonna briefly go through each of those just for the benefit of the public as well as the council that may not be as familiar. So Maine Clean Elections Act, which is found in 21A, is what's known as a block grant system, which is, uh, a system whereby a candidate goes out, collects a certain number of qualifying contributions um, for, to qualify as a clean elections candidate. And those, we'll get into some of the details later on, but it depends on whether you're running for governor, uh, state senate, or state house of representatives. Upon verification, the uh, ethics commission executive director, who has sort of in charge of uh, implementing the system, uh, certifies those can candidates and issues payments uh, immediately upon that certification. And there's also um, a program to, that allows supplemental financing uh, further along the, the timeline. We came across uh, Santa Fe's public campaign finance code as we were doing our research and when this was uh, given to us as a project. And their system is similar. It's a block grant system, um, very similar actually to Maine Clean Elections program at the municipal level. Santa Fe is a community that's about 88,000 people, so not horribly different from uh, Portland. Again, candidates go through a process of becoming certified and then they receive uh, disbursement from a clean elections fund. And it's enforced in that community by an ethics and campaign review board. Uh, we also, during the charter process, the idea of uh, Seattle was alluded to, raised, discussed. Seattle's very different. Seattle is more of a voucher program whereby every registered voter as of December 31st of the prior year receives what they call democracy vouchers. Um, and those are issued either via mail or email depending on the voter's preference. And then those vouchers, I think it's in $25 increments can then be assigned to candidates and signed over to those candidates to be exchanged for public funding. So as, as Jim mentioned, we have opted um, to recommend generally following the main Clean Elections Act and creating a new Article 5 within Chapter 9. And as Jim said, the public and potential candidates are likely more familiar with the current state system. The timeline allows for what we believe will be a faster implementation to meet charter requirements. Compared to the voucher system, this requires less public education, less procedural systems, uh, and 
I think you all received early on some correspondence from uh, the Maine Citizens for Clean Elections. They've also suggested a similar iterative, iterative approach uh, for this first year, and then we can reassess. Um, we're not completely uh, dis discounting the idea of a voucher program, but again, we're, we're in a condensed timeline. Um, we are also recommending uh, creating a new Article 6, which is um, not going to be the Clean Election Fund, but really addressing those charter changes that had to deal with candidates overall, um, campaign finance reform in general for foreign expenditures, foreign contributions, uh, what can be spent on ballot questions and the like. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Emily to actually go through the process of what we're proposing. All right, thank you all for having us here. Uh, my name is Emily Arvisu. So I'm gonna give you just kind of a high level overview of um, what it would look like for a candidate who decides to um, uh, participate um, as a clean election candidate. So what we're proposing, as Brandon said, is a block grant system that would be similar to Maine's Clean Election Act. Um, and so to participate in that, the process would be as follows. So first, the candidate would declare their intent to run as a clean election candidate, and this would involve um, filling out and filing a form um, that would be available with the city clerk. And on that form, the candidate would need to um, affirm certain statements. So that would include, for example, um, that the candidate will comply with the uh, restrictions and requirements of the clean election ordinance. Um, and that they would participate in at least one city-sponsored uh, forum or voter education event as is required by the, the charter. Next, um, the candidate would then be able to start collecting seed money contributions. So seed money contributions are used to defray the costs of uh, collecting qualifying contributions, which I will explain in just a minute. Um, but seed money contributions would be limited uh, to a certain dollar amount for each contribution and then also limited um, in the total amount of seed money uh, that can be collected. Then from there, the candidate begins uh, collecting uh, qualifying contributions. So the qualifying contributions are these small contributions that are intended to show that the candidate has public support. Um, so then by requiring candidates to collect a certain number of these small contributions, um, the candidate demonstrates that he or she has buy-in from voters. Um, so the ordinance would specify the amount of each contribution, um, as well as the number of contributions that would be required. And this can vary, you know, um, similar to with the Maine Clean Election Act. This can vary depending on whether somebody is running for mayor, running for council, running for school board. Um, then from there, uh, the candidate, um, let's see, sorry. The candidate would then apply to be certified as a participating candidate. So um, Brandon will talk in a minute about the timeline, but this would be a little bit farther down the road. They would submit certain required documentation to the city clerk, and then also submit along with that an application for certification. The city clerk would then review and verify all of the signatures and um, all of the documentation. Um, and this process would take place in tandem with the nomination and petition review and verification process. And then finally, um, once they've been approved as a certified participating uh, candidate, the public funds would be distributed to these certified participating candidates. They would all be distributed um, on the same day for everyone. Um, and then from there, they would run their campaign and after election, they would be required to return um, any unused funds from uh, the clean election. So, and Brandon's gonna talk next about the timeline of this process. So the, the timeline is, is relatively tight and some of this is dictated um, by charter for the general election, uh, as well as um, the budget and the fund being available this year. So election day is November 7th of this year. Uh, and I wanna be clear, we're proposing this for um, a, a 2023. Uh, there's a question later on in a later slide about feedback about maybe trying to adjust this timeline in the future, but, but we're talking about 2023 this evening. 
So June 30th, 2023 is when nomination papers become available. That's dictated in the charter. So in the charter, it talks about 127 days prior to the election is when nomination papers can be made available. Nomination papers can only be turned in in a certain period between 85 and 71 days prior to the election. Again, this is dictated in the charter. So that's August 14th through the 28th of this year. And then there are two major pre-election reports that are required. The 42-day pre is September 26th. The 11-day pre-election is October 27th. So down below, you see our proposed clean election dates. Uh, we are proposing that nomination papers and qualifying clean election papers be released on the same date, June 30th. We then, as Emily mentioned, um, are going to require that qualifying papers become due and certified simultaneously. It makes the clerk's life a little bit easier. Sometime, anytime between August 14th and August 28th. Seed money, which Emily explained, would begin once you pull your nomination and qualifying papers and run through August 14th. So you can only collect through that first sort of day that papers are due. There will be a requirement to report seed money um, as, as part of the reporting. That would be due on the 15th, the day after that the uh, collection date ends. Then the clerk's office will certify everything. September 8th is the date that we are uh, recommending that clean election funds be dispersed to everyone. That'll give finance enough time to cut the checks and get them out to all the candidates. Because of the tight timeline and because funds won't be available until September 8th, we are not proposing any sort of supplemental period, which may factor into what you all uh, decide for a policy of how much is given to a candidate right out of the gate, because the state allows one, it's a longer timeline, as Jim mentioned, um, and allows uh, additional signatures to be collected, qualifying contributions to be collected to, to trigger additional supplements. Um, our timeline's just too short, and the administrative burden that we think is going to be too much at that point. So that then leads us into our last really two slides, which we've pulled together as discussion purposes for the council. Um, in, in terms of the details that we're, we're looking for as we try to draft this ahead of our next um, workshop, there will be, of course, additional questions that we'll have and additional details that we'll need to go through that's the difference between state and, and local. So the cap, a cap on the fund within the budget. <clears throat> Santa Fe actually proposed, uh, has in their ordinance a cap uh, to, to fully fund the um, clean election fund. It's eight hundred thousand dollars. It is. They continue to contribute one hundred and fifty each year. But if it gets to eight hundred thousand, they are not required to put in any additional money um, until it goes below that amount, and then they have to refund it in a future budget. And then we're going to need some guidance on how many qualifying contributions are required to participate. Some of the context here uh, to to keep in mind. Um, our state, our at-large and mayor races are bigger than our state Senate districts. Our district seats are bigger than our house races. Um, so when you, it's not apples to apples when you're comparing these numbers. So for a main house seat, you need to collect 60 qualifying contributions. For a main Senate seat, it's 175. I've given you for context, our nomination petition requirements. For mayor, it's 300 valid signatures for an at-large, it's a similar 300 valid signatures, and that is also for the school board. And then for a district race, it's 75 valid signatures, um, which also includes school board races. Um, another thing that we're gonna have to discuss is the amount of the qualifying contribution. The state's been $5 since the get-go, there's no, we can stick with five dollars. There's nothing that requires the city to stay with five dollars. Um, it may help with some of the funding of it if if it's more than that. Uh, with as you're previously discussing the budget considerations, seed money contributions and limits and amounts. So under the current state system, it's a hundred dollar contribution, and House candidates may may not collect more than a thousand. Senate candidates may not collect more than three thousand. Uh, if there's, 
and I, we haven't spoken to the state about this, if there's any seed money left over after the candidate qualifies, the amount still in the seed money is deducted from the amount given to the candidate out of the clean elections fund. So there's a differential there as well. Um, so those numbers, again, just giving you for the context what, what the state has. And then finally, the question of how much each candidate gets. Uh, distinguishing between uh, contested races versus uncontested races. Um, again, we don't have primaries, so I, I don't know that we've ever had a completely uncontested race. We probably have, but um, this these numbers are what uh, were given to the state program for general election. I did not include primary numbers here. So for a contested house race, the initial funding was 5,475 with the ability for a house candidate to get 11,000 more in supplemental funding, bringing it to about 16, a little over 16. Uh, contested Senate race was 21,850 with an additional $43,800 in, in supplemental if you qualify for the max amount. Um, again, those required additional signatures, additional $500 contributions, uh, and it was uh, sort of staggered up. And then again, um, we'll want to discuss possibly trying to anticipate a timeline for future races given, given this tight timeline. And then finally, um, working on uh, the second um, workshop, there'll be some differences that we're gonna have to anticipate um, given that we don't have a party system here. Um, the state limits what the uh, funds can be used on, uh, challenges, recounts, um, those type of things typically cannot be used. Uh, clean election funds at the state level cannot be used. Um, we may need to anticipate clean election funds being used, but that is uh, what we anticipate this sort of real nitty gritty weedy details for, for workshop number two. Um, so with that, we will step back and allow the council to ask us any questions or, or the public uh, hearing to start. Okay, again, thank you all very much for being here and for that presentation. So that concludes the introduction section of the agenda tonight. So we'll launch right into our public hearing. It's 635 and um, we are happy to hear from you in person or on Zoom. We've got a hand up on Zoom, so I'll start there. And if we could just stick to our usual um, uh, kind of guidance regarding public comment, please give us your first and last name, the organization you represent um, or the neighborhood that you live in. And we'll give you three minutes on the clock and our clerk will remind you at 30 seconds um, so again, we'll hop over to uh, Zoom first and toggle back and forth if we've got folks in chambers who would like to speak up. Uh, first, Marfine Chan. Hi, uh, Marfine Chan, uh, one of the at-large charter commissioners who uh, voted in favor of this proposal. Glad that it is being taken up by the council. Um, I just had a few suggestions uh, for the council to consider. Um, number one, um, similar to other uh, federal taxes and state taxes, um, including an option for property taxpayers and people paying fees to contribute a small amount to the Clean Elections Fund for the city. Um, and then the second, um, I know there's mention of $5 con qualifying contributions. Um, I was wondering if uh, the council would consider a sliding scale for, you know, we're living in a time of inflation and, and economic hardship. So Five dollars, believe it or not, can be a lot for someone. Um, so a sliding scale for folks who can't quite uh, make it make that five dollar contribution, but also um, I imagine some folks would want to give a little bit more as well. Um, glad you're taking this up and uh, looking forward to watching the proceedings. Thank you. Thank you for your comment, Marfine. Okay, now we'll turn to our next speaker, speaker in council chambers. Good evening, Mayor Snyder, members of the council. My name is Anna Keller. I'm the executive director of Maine Citizens for Clean Elections and a resident of Portland. Maine Citizens for Clean Elections is a nonpartisan nonprofit that works to make sure our campaign finance and election laws are in the public interest. 
and we have been involved in the state clean elections effort since its early days in the 90s and are obviously big fans of the Maine Clean Election Act as a model, as well as, of course, being involved in the bringing this um, charter change to Portland. In the memo that you all received and which we'll make sure we submit for official public comments, which is on the public uh, record as well, we put forward some proposed qualifying contribution amounts and um, distributions to candidates. And while I won't go into the specifics of those amounts right now, I did want to flag for you our process for getting there. And what we did was we looked at both the amounts that are at the state level and the signatures and thinking about how that might be made relevant to the size of districts in Portland. But we also looked at the historical pattern of spending and races because the population size doesn't necessarily tell you how competitive these races are and how much money candidates have historically needed or felt they needed to run competitive races. So for that reason, you might see that an at-large city councilor, an at-large school board member, and the mayor, though they're all representing the same number of people, perhaps should have different amounts of qualifying contributions, different amounts of funding that they can qualify for. So I'd encourage you to make sure that that historical record of what is needed is also um, part of how you look at this proposal. A couple other things that come up looking at this timeline tonight. This is a very tight timeline and it is, um, some of that is, you know, an immovable object with the calendar that we're dealing with this year. I do have some concerns that the lack of any supplemental morning. funding could be a problem. Um, and so I'd encourage you to think about, even if it is allowing additional qualifying contributions to be turned in at the same time as the regular ones, allowing some way for candidates to right size their campaign. Because not every election is the same. Some districts at some times will be much more competitive than others and allowing candidates some flexibility is essential to making sure that the program has high participation and high participation in this first year, even with all the limitations we're dealing with is gonna be really essential to the long-term success of the program. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, any additional hands on Zoom or in the chambers, feel free to step forward. I don't have any hands on Zoom at the moment. So if you're here in chambers and you'd like to offer public comment, we would welcome that. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Catherine Buxton, uh, Reed Street in Portland. I was also on the Charter Commission, so uh, don't hold that against me. Um, I am very excited that you all are taking this up um, and I mostly wanna encourage the council to utilize the breadth of resources that we have locally, in addition to your legal counsel, um, Anna Keller, the League of Women Voters, um, uh, citizens, Maine Citizens for Clean Elections have all been named. The Charter Commission did extensive research. Um, and especially as we are, as you are designing this program, I want to echo um, the thoughts that um, were presented in the memo that you received around creating a pilot program now with space to change and grow and incorporate other forms of public funding um, as we see the changing needs of voters in Portland. Um, and there's a lot of really great resources linked in the Charter Commission's final report and on our website. And I'm happy to reshare those with you, but I think going into this process with a broad sense of what are the possibilities will help you design a program that can meet the needs further in the future. Um, the last thing I want to draw attention to is that foreign contribution ban that Jim brought up um, as one of the stipulations in the charter. Um, it's not currently in Maine state law. However, um, there are examples of this in other cities, um, and I think it's really important for the council to think 
hard about um, creating a program that restricts foreign contributions from multinational corporations. We've seen an uptick um, in recent years in spending from corporations like Airbnb and Uber, et cetera, on ballot questions specifically. And this clause takes advantage of a small window of opportunity that we have here in Portland to actually curb the influence of those corporations. Um, this isn't an attempt to limit um, new Mainers from participating in democracy. It does not um, limit the ability for individuals to get involved and donate. Um, it simply um, restricts large corporations that have foreign influence um, from spending on our elections. Seattle, for example, um, which this was somewhat based on limited contributions um, from multinational corporations with multiple foreign owners, 5% or more, or 1% with a single foreign owner from donating to candidate campaigns. And they were intentionally incredibly restrictive in order to prevent companies like Amazon from spending on their elections. And so I would really encourage you to do some more research. Good morning. Happy, thank you. I'm happy to also connect with you um, outside of this meeting, but thank you again for your time. Thank you for your comment. Okay. Thanks everybody for commenting. I don't see any other hands up on Zoom. I don't think I see anybody else standing forward, stepping forward into council chambers. So that was a quick public hearing, but thank you to those who came forward tonight and offered your perspective. I'm gonna close public comment um, as we have that listed on the agenda tonight and we will move into the next section of our workshop, um, which is the review and discussion of uh, clean election laws. And um, so this really this really opens us up and um, uh, for question asking and sharing thoughts. And um, one of the things that we were just, I was trying to reground myself in is our timing here. We had originally thought we would do workshop one tonight, um, get information, have time between workshop one and workshop two, uh, which is on the 27th. Um, to, to move us toward um, action on uh, for, with a first read on April 10th and a final action on April 24th. If we had to move that, because that is pretty tight, um, if we had to move that to a first read on April 24th with a, a council action on May 1st, I think that's a possibility. So I'm just putting that up, but that's our intention um, is when we started to put these plans together after the voters um, voted in November, um, you know, we, we know that we'll be taking action on the budget in May. So that, that piece of it will be um, ready once the council has done that work on May 15th. Um, but our intention is to make sure that this program is in place uh, in uh, ideally in April, um, May 1st at the latest, so that people really can get their heads around it well in advance of those papers being available on June 30th. So a little bit of context there. Um, I'm gonna open this up to my colleagues, both on Zoom and in chambers to ask questions and offer thoughts. Councilor Tavaro. I'm just wondering if we have the Perkins Thompson memo. I didn't see it in our packet. The one that was just presented. The presentation. Yeah. No memo for state make that power. It would be great because I'd like to have just the timeline in front of me. Thank you. Thank you. And maybe we can get that added to tonight's agenda so that anybody who goes and looks at the materials from tonight will be able to see that. I, I just have a couple quick starting questions, which really, um, this may be just a question for the clerk and people have asked, this isn't specific to the creation of our, our program or this or the, the details of the program, but what if, what if there's a candidate um, who has funding from a past election? So savings from a, um, a, a past campaign, are they able to use that funding before this program gets put into place? So that's one of the decisions that needs to be made when we make this program is if a candidate currently has funds um, from a prior election um, and they're still doing their reporting, they're still holding funds and or they're out there actively getting um, contributions um, under like uh, the thought of being traditionally financed as it's set up now. Um, one of the decisions that we have to make is if they're going to have to dissolve that before they opt into this. Okay, thank you. I have a whole list of questions that are kind of simple questions, but I'm happy to, to save those. And I expect my colleagues will have a lot of them too. So Councillor Pelletier. Thank you. Yeah, I'm just jotting just random questions down. I just noticed um, 
is there a minimum amount of qualifying contribu- contributions for Maine's clean election law? It says it's five dollars. That said, is that the lowest that it can be? Is that is there a minimum? No, that that's the amount. It's just five dollars. Okay. Okay. Got it. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Ali has a hand up on Zoom. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mayor. I think uh, you asked one of the questions that I was going to ask. Uh, uh, if uh, for whatever reason, a candidate does have uh, some funds left over from previous campaigns. Uh, so I have a follow up question. What if that candidate doesn't want to do the uh, public financing? That is one. The second one is that um, uh, did the time to pick up papers for elections change from July to June? Um, if yes, if there's a candidate that says that I don't want to do the public funding, I want to raise my own money, do they also have to take up papers in June? Uh, yes. So, uh, the paper, the timeline to take out nomination papers has not changed. It's, it's always been the, the June 30th. Um, and if a candidate does not want to opt in for this clean elections, they do not have to, they can still be a traditionally financed candidate, uh, under the same rules that they have, uh, been able to be, uh, in the prior years. So it's, it's an either or. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Councillor Ali, Councillor Fournier, and then Rodriguez. Thank you. Um, I actually don't have a lot of questions. Um, as everyone may know, I know quite a bit about this <laughs> from before my council days. Um, what I would just offer, um, just really as more of a follow-up statement to what we're hearing today is, um, this is a really short timeline. And so I would propose, as we've heard, a, a type of pilot for this year, just trying to implement it as closely to what the state has available so that we have a good roadmap with the understanding that as we move forward, we have opportunities to adjust and correct. Um, but knowing I'm shocked that it's March 13th already. <laughs> and so just thinking um, how quickly we're trying to move, knowing what our meeting schedule is and all of the other things that we have going on. Um, my suggestions would really be to model it as closely to the state program as possible. And then again, do those adjustments. I love the idea of a sliding scale to be able to let everyone participate. I think from a, a, the reality of implementing that year one with such a short time frame, I don't know that I would be supportive of that right out of the gate. I do like the, the state has that $5 entry um, and being able to do that and I think the big questions for me, and really that's I think gonna be a discussion with all of us is what is the the limit for how many signatures you need to get in order to opt into this? Um, I'm really excited that we're doing this. Um, and then the um, other question that I would be interested in is just that restriction on fund use, like how are these funds uh, able to be used? Um, but other than that, I don't have any other questions. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Rodriguez. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I, same thing, kind of like all over the place questions, probably not in um, intelligent order. Um, I suppose the voucher program is kind of like um, beyond um, reach, but I'm, I'm still interested in finding out if there is a municipality the size of Portland that does run a voucher program. Um, Seattle is just proportionally so much bigger, so it's hard to even um, compare it just from a beginning um, observational kind of point of view. Um, I, I didn't understand the Santa Fe having a cap on the fund. I don't think I fully understand what's the rationale behind having a cap. Maybe it's obvious and I'm not missing, and I'm not getting it. So the, we didn't speak to anyone specifically in Santa Fe. It's just looking at the ordinance itself. I think the intent is they have determined that 800,000 is enough to run the fund. So every year, year over year, when they're doing the budget discussions, if the fund has 800,000, they are not required to budget more money into that fund. If it goes down below that, then that next budget year, they'll have to, to fund it. So it gives, I think that council, I think it's a council, some flexibility with not feeling like they have to create this. If, you, if you're mandated to put 150, dollars $200,000 every year, and it's not drawn down, you could, you could have a fund that's over, overfunded. Um, so 
I think I, I also agree with the differentiating uh, on the types of races, uh, not just within like at large, but rather what office we're running for, because there is a big and looking at historical data to, to help us guide that. I think there is we're going to find some really um, helpful context there or data there. Um, as far as the pilot program on the first year, I'm, I guess I'm, I'm it'd be I'm unsure how much then we could deviate from a, a pilot program or how much a pilot program kind of sets us um, into a precedent that then we can switch from. Um, and I also, um, I'm sorry, I know I'm throwing questions. I did not expect answers. <laughs> um, I also, I want to heed the advice or rather the, the call for the first year's participation being really important. Um, so I'm wondering how, how does having a pilot program um, reconcile, you know, the, the work that goes into trying to, you know, incentivize people to, to get into the program, hence having a, a successful first year, because I guess, yeah, I, again, given that there might be a completely different or very different program in the future, again, just a thought, and then necessarily I'm looking for a question out there or an answer. Um, and then I'm also, I, I'm interested to hear more. I'm from a, I, ideal point of view, I, the foreign contributions piece, restricting them seems to be important to me. Um, interested to just learn more about how that plays into it and how much of that can be, um, you know, worked into the, the right from the beginning um, or how much, or do we have to be a little bit more thoughtful about that because it is kind of uh, newish territory. And what else did I have here? Oh yeah, I guess um, are we anticipating there. Perhaps I missed this too. That there being an ethics committee that oversees this, or is all going to fall on the the clerk's office? I have that question too. <laughs> okay, I can. Keep, I don't need answers. <laughs> are we talking about if there was an issue? I guess there was an example from the was it the Seattle one or Santa Fe that has an ethics committee that oversees it. So I, I didn't know if we were anticipating that a similar kind of oversight um, body for, for ourselves or would it just fall in the city clerk's office? If I may, uh, there's also a, a, an ethics commission in the sense for the state mm -hmm. program as well. Uh, what we are thinking of is that perhaps if there are any uh, appeals from decisions of the clerk, like not to certify someone or revocation of someone's certification because it violated the terms of the agreement, uh, that perhaps those appeals initially would go to the city council because there is no ethics commission yet to go to, and that perhaps that would be a task for the ethics commission that uh, should be that will be created at some point in the future. Thank you. Um, okay, and then the last comment. Um, I, I appreciate seeing or revisiting the number of signatures that are required for each of the different municipal offices um, and even the, the state offices. I'm not entirely sure that I understand what to draw from it in terms of like, how does it correlate to the amount of um, qualifying contributions that we'll be requiring? It's, yeah, because you know, like asking for a signature is a little bit different than asking for even five bucks as it, as it was stated. So for that reason, I'm, I, I appreciate the proportional um, changes or differences that we can see from the different offices. Um, but I, I just don't want us to to start thinking like, oh, we're going to ask for 125 five dollar donations, um, and that being the number that we're starting with. Not that that's, I don't even know how to measure how that sounds. Um, that's all I have. I know I asked some questions, made some comments. I'm just sort of kind of think of how the, the important things or the things that stood out to me today. That's all. Thank you. Jim, can I ask you a question? Would you recommend that the creation of the ethics commission happen earlier? in order to address that issue? It could. I mean, uh, you would need this as a, as a body, but uh, to think that the Ethics Commission, having worked on the charter provision uh, for that, to think that that could be created when get consensus uh, before July 1 of this year. Um, I know it's impossible. I, I, I'm, I'm with you on that. I'm just trying to understand the... Um, I understand it would be a pilot program, but it sounds like that may be a necessary piece of the puzzle. So I'm just trying to understand how they all fit together. Yeah, it would be awkward for city councilors to be hearing appeals from persons who are 
seeking funding to run for city council, whether they're that, on that was on. exactly what my concern. Was. And, and we appreciate that. That puts people in a very awkward position. On the other hand, I, I don't see how you could have an ethics commission ordinance adopted by July one and have people in place. It it just would be quite difficult. Can I piggyback on that? Because we've been trying to sequence the work that the voters have prioritized through the Charter Commission's um, amendments. And the Ethics Commission that was envisioned by the Charter Commission, I don't believe it's the same as an Ethics Commission with election. Uh, so at the state level, we've got the commission, which is the Commission on Governmental Ethics and Election Practices. Was elect Were election practices specifically called out in the amendment to the charter that was approved by the voters. I don't think anyone was thinking that far ahead on that particular issue. Right. So I don't think it is. Um, but I will ordinance, perhaps I'm, I'm spitballing, uh, it, it, perhaps by ordinance, that's something that that could be uh, could oh, be added. OK. I was wondering, Jim, if because of the the sort of broad parameters that seem to be provided there, if if they could get dive into that as one of the things that they would look at. The important thing is too, when you look back on the uh, the ethics commission part in the charter that was adopted, the ethics ordinance comes first, and then the creation of the uh, the commission to to inf uh, enforce it. So. Uh, I've actually asked staff to walk me through this because I want to do my best to understand. So from what I understand with the Ethics Commission, we have to form an Ethics Commission by ordinance, almost like we have formed a planning board by ordinance. That's not the ordinance governing the, elect, the Ethics Commission, it's the ordinance to create it. Mm -hmm. And then you got to nominate and appoint the Ethics Commission members, and then they actually help um, to develop a code of ethics. So we don't adopt an ordinance here at the council level without that ethics commission in place. So there's three different steps to get their input That's before cool. we get there. Right. And without the elections piece being called out in the charter commission's recommendation for question eight, I think that we, we are running into a sticky situation here with um, oh, that oversight element from the state um, like you said, especially if we've got council candidates. <laughs> well, if you want, we could work on putting together an appellate body for uh, for decisions of the clerk as part of this ordinance. We just uh, we, we were suggesting the council as a stopgap measure, thinking that perhaps it could mm -hmm. go to an ethics commission. That doesn't bar you from doing anything different in the future. Uh, you could give the the uh, duties of this elections appeal board uh, to some other body, perhaps down the road, if it if it's appropriate. But uh, we can work on incorporating now an appeal step and body into this. So uh, you may have already addressed this, and maybe I missed it. But let's say we've got a certain number of candidates, or c council members who are candidates for district seats, mayor at large, whatever. Um, if if this body were to be overseeing through that ethics commission capacity, would those folks have to recuse themselves from any work? That would be an interesting question. <laughs> and we're, we're not quite ready to go there today. Okay, I'm going to just flag that as a question. Understood. Um, okay, I actually, uh, Council Rodriguez, I feel like we jumped in on you. Or are you, okay. Um, uh, so that was one of my questions about the commission. Um, another just quick question that you don't have to answer now, but I'm going to toss out there is, do we have the capacity to have a local option for a tax checkoff program? So when with the state, you can make an additional contribution when you're paying your taxes. Um, is that a local option? Could folks make a contribution to our clean elections program? Not as a matter of statute. And we all use forms for municipal tax collection that are approved by and generated by the state um, main revenue services. So I remember that the property tax, although it's collected and used locally, is a state program and mm. state admin we just administer a state program so i would be very wary on that one i figured but i thought it was worth asking that's my job uh but um, no i'd just be a little concerned about your ability to do that at this point okay um well actually just quick this 
as we, you know, we want, there's an urgency here, like you mentioned, Jim, there's an urgency to get the work done, but we also want to plot it out carefully enough that we all have time to do what we're looking to do. Um, uh, so I'm thinking about uh, current council members, would there be any reason for a current council member who intends to run for office to, I, I, I think I'm answering my own question, it wouldn't be a problem to vote on this because probably people won't have taken out papers by the time this council takes action. Okay. So asked and answered. That's, uh, that's a question that potentially is raised. I've been discussing it with corporation counsel's office and I'm sure yeah. there'll be some more authoritative advice to provide as that gets closer. Okie doke. Um, earlier, Jim, you said, or, or maybe Ashley, it was you who said we would need to decide this. So let's say a candidate has funding from a previous campaign and they wanna start doing something with it in the next couple of months. You're saying we need to decide that as part of our program so is it kind of like caution, don't spend money right now? Well, that's, that's one of the, the, you know, the things that they're opting in for this clean elections. Are they going to be able to carry any funds? Um, I think that the answer is going to be no, they should be dissolving their funds. But that's a, that's a, well, that. If I may. <laughs> um, so we have, given the timeline, we have started putting some meat on the bones of, of a draft ordinance and looking at the state. Um, I think the short answer is if a candidate is going to be running in this cycle that already has a registration and, and private funds, they probably should hold off on spending those funds. The state has some ability to disperse of those funds. I think one of the recommendations that we're going to make is that it could be donated to the allowed uses as though you were ending any other campaign, but also perhaps donating it to the clean election fund. So in essence, you'd be giving the city money back to take money out, but um, there are some disqualifying expenditures and that's sort of the nitty gritty for workshop number two that we will be discussing. But I think the safe answer for now, so there's no question is probably don't collect money and don't spend money. Okay. Don't collect money and don't spend money. Um, this is the last thing from me for the moment. Um, so I'm looking, um, again, back at this kind of summary memo from November 30th with regard to council requirements as it relates to the charter amendments. And um, so we need to establish an ordinance um, and fully fund a city of Portland clean elections fund. So we'll do the funding through our budget work and that'll finalize hopefully on May 15th. The ordinance, um, we gotta do it. We're, we're required to do it. So whether we call it a pilot or not, I think it's going to be an ordinance which could be amended. And so I just wanted to throw this out there as a, I mean, we could kind of throw the context around it and say, we're establishing this ordinance and we intend to take it up again um, and amend as we make our way. Or you had mentioned another option there. Yeah, I don't know if Jim, I mean, I'm not sure if the, this is not something I love to do, but I was thinking about a sunset period just so that we would have to look at it again? Well, you could do that too. I think the idea is to have a solid enough program as a basis in the first place so that you wouldn't want to necessarily sunset it. But I think everyone's intention is to mm. put something in place and see how it operates. I mean, you want as much buy-in as possible to make it successful. And that's why it has to be a strong program at the beginning. Uh, but we know that there will be some changes that will be made along the way. Either way works. Uh, and let us know what you prefer. And we could put a sunset on that as well. Okay. Sunsets make me nervous because you never know what's coming down the pike. Um, <laughs> um, the only the only positive with the sunset, and I'll just put this out there, is they actually make me feel a little more comfortable because I know it's going to end and I have to look at it again and I don't want it to fall off anybody's radar screen. I'm not going to say it's going to, but that was the only reason why I was thinking about it. But I think either way works. Okay. I think it's just good to put it out there. Um, the other piece, I guess, and um, Brandon, maybe I'm looking at, you don't have to answer this, but for our next workshop, um, we've talked a little bit about the prohibition on foreign contributions, and um, I, that's pretty well spelled out in the charter's uh, work, isn't it? Yeah, and, and I may have skimmed over this in the, in the presentation. We're actually proposing two separate ordinances, so within Chapter 9, Article 5, which will be the Clean Election Fund, and then an Article 6, that sort of hits all of the things that were part of um, section 13 in question three, um, because the, the charter language does say the city council shall by ordinance enact a prohibition on ballot questions or expenditures from any entity, et cetera. So there's, instead of trying to mix metaphors for lack of a better word with the clean election fund, 
some of these restrictions will affect candidates across the board. Um, and some of the language is spelled out pretty well already in the charter, but no, no problem. If we're going to create Article 6, we can reiterate everything. So when people go, um, one of the things I learned through this process is I went to Chapter 9, and there's not a heck of a lot there, and had to go to, to the charter. So if everything's sort of nice and neat in Chapter 9 as well, um, so that's that's the proposal. We'll, we'll be seeing actually two separate sections within Chapter 9. That's helpful. Thank you. Councillor Deferro. Our, um, for tonight, are you looking for feedback on like specific guidance on numbers or is that for next week? Is this mainly just questions? Well, if you, if you have some, some uh, preferences at this state that you'd like to mention, that would be great because uh, we can come back with some proposals at least people can react to. Okay. Um, so I, I, I think I'm ready to get close to that at this point. I think, um, the suggestion by mean clean elections about um, looking at kind of historically how much has been raised and spent in each of these elections as a guiding point is a good one. Um, I am looking at the um, table in, in their memo that was provided to us that gives sort of basic total or potential totals for each um, for each seat, and I think it it's it is based on what people have raised and spent historically. I don't know if I would quite go. I think that this is this is going to be a heavily utilized program, um, and so I think that there may actually be an opportunity to kind of um, curb election spending and curb election um, finance through this program overall, and so. Um, just going with kind of what has been like the total amount of what has been spent in recent campaigns, um, we could probably come down from that a little bit. Um, you know, I, I mean, I serve in a district seat and I think, you know, $10,000 for my seat is plenty. It's exactly what, what is needed. Um, and in terms of number of $5 contributions, I... Um, I think it's a tight time frame. I can't remember exactly how much time was allotted, but I would say like if it's one month, maybe compare how many months do the state candidates have for that and how many do they have to collect in that period of time and then adjust it accordingly. But I would say too that we could probably add on to that because um, we do have larger districts and um, we have higher density. That number applies to, to districts equally across the state. And many of the districts across the state are much more rural than Portland. And so if a candidate is going door to door, they have a potential, I think, to collect more and more quickly. Um, and then as far as seed money, I mean, I don't, I don't really have a huge I think um, what's outlined in the memo is a decent idea on that. I think um, the thing to think about is when this money is going to get dispersed. Did you say it was not until September? Yeah, September 8th, given yeah. the time to, for the clerk's office to certify and then to go to the finance department to get the checks actually cut. September 8th was working with um, the city clerk tightest we could get given backing into it. Yeah. So I, I mean, I don't know, cause that's late, you know, it, candidates are all ready. I mean, I think you can, can you still put your signs out in August at this point? So where has that changed? The rule is uh, it's, what is it? 12 weeks, 12 weeks total. So from the day your sign is out, you're only allowed to have it out for 12 weeks. Okay. So I don't know what that would calculate, but if it's in August and then, you know, it's signs is an expense that you would incur before you even get your distribution. So I think perhaps that's something to think about in terms of seed money, because seed money would be for your initial expenses, I guess. If I may, just one other thing to um, that we're trying to anticipate in the ordinance itself is you're going to fund it with X amount. We don't know how many candidates may or may not be running for each seat for mayor. So 
if there's not enough money in the fund, we are anticipating sort of a proration mm -hmm. adjustment of that. Um, Councilor Trevara, in terms of your C money, um, that's part of the timeline for the future. Uh, we can certainly try to look at it based on your feedback. Um, the state system, you're technically a candidate before um, you can even really start doing the seed money collection and they have the longer um, runway for the primary. We were trying to avoid a very complicated ordinance whereby if somebody starts collecting seed money but doesn't qualify as a candidate, but it has, so it's, there are a lot of moving parts that we've been trying to anticipate. The easiest, simplest was to just line it up with sort of the nomination section, but we can certainly try to, to look at that. Okay. Um, I think those are basically the pieces. Um, I did have one question. So the state, if I'm remembering correctly, they now do, or they did this last time, do disbursements in cycles. So you collect so many checks, you qualify for your initial disbursement, and then you can collect up to X amount more in order to qualify for additional um, was that, because I don't think that was the way it always worked, was that by virtue of how much of a pool they had available, or I don't know if you have information on that. Maybe it is the way it always is. Get those supplementals, others might have a better grasp of that piece. But the, the, the point is that, uh, and, and I'm sure they'll get right up and say something, and I want to, and I want to hear it. I think that the, the question here is, at the point when you're having early voting, um, and your head of work is putting together the ballots and you're trying to manage the election, that may be difficult to take care of the supplemental. Now, I know there was a suggestion that maybe supplemental could happen at the same time that you come in with your initial qualifying contributions. That's all something we can work on, but that was yeah. the reason why we omitted it. I'd right, like and I'm not necessarily, in my mind, I'm not necessarily thinking about it in terms of, because that's a way we want to structure it, but I'm thinking about it in terms of how we, could potentially deal with an over an over budgeting. Um, I wonder if I, I could perhaps call on um, Ms. Keller to answer that question, if she knows the history. Yeah, so there's been, you're right that the supplemental funding system that's in there now is not how it was originally set up. Um, when the Clean Elections Act was passed in 96, there was a provision for matching funds. So what happened then was if you were running clean elections, your opponent was running privately funded, they start they raised more money than you. They you both filed your reports, you saw they had raised more money, you would automatically get more clean elections money to bring you up to the same level, up to a, a cap, but that that would happen automatically. That provision was struck down in Arizona's clean elections law by the Supreme Court. And so the 2015 statewide clean elections referendum was to create this supplemental funding system. And it was created partly because without those matching funds, participation was tanking um, because you could get very outspent. And so we're talking a much shorter timeline here. It looks almost more like the clean elections at the state level in a primary where there aren't supplemental because it's just April to June. But I will I'll I won't advocate more in this space, but I think that looking at the ability to have those supplementals could be um, important and certainly something that you would want to include if you were looking at a longer timeline for future years. Okay. Thank you. That's helpful. That's a good refresher. Um, I think that that's everything I have for now. Thank you. Did you have something, Ashley? Okay. We have a hand up from Councillor Ali. Uh, thank you, uh, Mayor. I just have a, a feedback uh, that um, due to uh, staffing challenge, um, we know that when you order yard signs, it takes uh, uh, a long time. So if uh, uh, the time of dispersing the funds is put in September, it will put a lot of uh, candidates at a disadvantage because it takes close to five weeks uh, for uh, lawn and yard signs, whereby um, palm cards can be printed locally. So I have a question. Can a candidate borrow money to fund their yard signs in the process so that uh, when the uh, 
a, the city clerk's office start dispersing the funds, they can pay whoever they borrowed the money from. So if we're if we're matching the state system, borrowing money um, is is like a contribution. So it would likely be prohibited. Um, the intent, though, with the seed money, and it may be worth exploring a larger seed money um, level, is to allow for for those type of necessary expenditures early on. The other um, thing that that we're contemplating that we've been discussing is there's nothing that prohibits taking on debt until you're funded. So um, ordering ordering signs and being invoiced through your campaign will likely be allowed. You just wouldn't be able to cut the check to your website designer or your sign manufacturer until that check comes into your bank account on September 8th. So those are the two ways I think of addressing that in the current uh, arena that we're, we're working in. Thank you, Brandon. Uh, thank you. Brandon. Yeah, Councillor Ali, back to you. Yeah, thank you, uh, Mayor. That's all. It's just um, um, feedback and a question. Okay, thank you. Councillor Rodriguez. Thank you. Um, I think I need um, just clarification on when we ask, when we asked the question about, um, I think we asked it a, in, like putting fees in place to help fund um, the program. The, did we go over the, the answer? Did we say that that's something that is not an option or we just said based on the timeline, putting that in place right now seems, but long-term is it still possible? Well, I think that the timeline is one issue, but more importantly, uh, the state has real control over the property tax administration. We, we get to you know, hire the assessor and, and send out the tax bills, but the state tells you what's on the tax bills. And so if we could, for us to put on a check off, for example, you know, a dollar or two dollars for this. Uh, we might have to go to Augusta for that one. Um, what if it's not a tax? If it's some other, you know, voluntary fee that folks can just literally like a donation? Well, people can always donate to the Clean Elections Fund. Okay. That's that's something that's permissible. All right, but that wouldn't be necessarily something we we put as a fee. It would just be like an actual donation. Okay. Thank you, uh, thank you Councillor. Um, do municipalities that uh, administer a clean elections program, I guess, or, or, or this, even the state of Maine, do we limit the number of qualifying candidates? Or like you said earlier, Brandon, does the pool of money get distributed differently depending on the numbers? Or could it? It's a possibility. And I'll, I'll look to Emily as well. Everything that we looked at had sort of a proration. Um, okay. I don't remember seeing anything in what we reviewed of a, a municipality that limited the number of candidates that could participate. If the funding wasn't there, it, it got less. And I believe that's in Seattle, if I remember correctly. And us, I know it's in Santa Fe's and there may have been a couple others that have this sort of proration. Okay, so I guess bear with me here for a second. So let's say we had $280,000 and we said, Here's what you get if you're a district candidate. Here's what you get if you're an at-large candidate. Here's what you get if you're a mayoral candidate. And we lay it all out. And more people than we thought, or, or just a, lot, a heck of a lot of people run. And so that funding, those funding designations aren't possible. So that's when the proration comes in. And we say, oops, actually. So does the, I'm looking at the state of Maine law and, it, and there's their actual numbers in their law. Um, <laughs> So would we do that in our ordinance and just how, how do you handle proration if you've got funding amounts articulated in an ordinance? I, I think it would be in the it, dividing it out and figuring it out. Uh, we can try to keep it as simple as you would prorate it based on the number of candidates to, with in the certain district, certain type of candidate by the amount that's in the fund. Um, that's how Santa Fe does it. Um, and I think this also helps um, support at least the funding because we have that short timeline, at least for this year, having all of the disbursements made at once because we'll know how much needs to go out. Mm -hmm. And and admittedly, it's 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 later than I think a lot of people would want, but it's it's sort of the the world we're we're trying to live in. But yeah, I think it would be a simple math equation. So we know how much a mayor's 
candidate can get, how much a, an at-large can get for school board versus council and how much a district school board for council. If it's 10 candidates over the course of that 280,000, it may be prorated less out, which um, I think would we would anticipate allowing at that point a candidate to withdraw as being a clean elections candidate. So that that proration language and the opt out could live in the ordinance. I, I think it does in Santa Fe. Just to give yeah. you that that sort of that clause. And then and then I, I also I also like the just this is a little bit of feedback. I like the contested versus uncontested. So we may want to think about that in our local ordinance. If you're in an uncontested race, maybe your your funding looks different than if you're in a multi-person race. Thank you. Yeah. So just to jump in on the question. Um so Santa Fe, the, the way that their ordinance works, I believe, is they lay out the dollar amounts for each, you know, different race. Um, but then along with that, they have a provision that says, you know, in the event that um, the amount uh, required to be distributed out exceeds what's actually in the fund, then all of these will be prorated. So you can draft it right in there. And then um, uh, what was the other... Oh yeah, right. And then along with that, it does give that option for candidates to withdraw at that point. Um, so I think it's it's very possible to set forth, you know, the dollar amounts, but also make it clear within the ordinance that, you know, we're anticipating that there may become a situation where these aren't possible, in which case it will be prorated, but you can withdraw. So thank you. Yep. That's helpful, Councilor Rodriguez. Yeah, I'm sorry. Um, can sorry, it's a silly question. Um, can a candidate withdraw after they've received their um, um, money from this? Uh, we haven't come across an ordinance that allows that. Um, I think it would get very complicated to have a clean elections candidate return the funds and then become traditional. And then how do you handle what's been spent? I, I, I mean, I guess I could envision somehow drafting it, but I think it would be an overly complicated system uh, and burdensome for, for the clerk's office, especially this initial year. Yeah. yeah I'm just picturing, you know, if you if you do see this inevitable kind of ridiculously outspent, you know, race with your opponent and, you know, there's no other way out. So I just, mm. that's why I asked it. Carrying on with that, if, I'm just wondering if somebody qualified and got their disbursement and then said, oh, I don't really want to run, could they kind of fall into this unspent revenue category where there's a report or they could, and I guess we have to, we have to maybe think about that, that, that possibility that somebody could do all the steps and then, you know, well into the game say, I, you know, I actually have to pull my candidacy. Yeah. I guess potentially. Uh, the one thing I wanted to add was similar to the um, nomination papers that are released, you sort of certify that you're not going to withdraw. You're not, I, there's a certification at the state level too. Once you sort of submit to be a clean elections candidate, now we don't, the state doesn't have the budgetary restraints that we may be looking at, um, but they sort of certify you are going to be a clean. If you qualify, you collect the, the $5, you collect your seed money, you're, you're in. Um, so it's trying to come up with a hybrid may be difficult, but that's you're sort of if you're in, you're in okay. uh, is generally the how it works once you've qualified. And given that qualification for the program and certification from the clerk happen simultaneously, you are a candidate on the ballot no matter what. So you could just qualify for that reporting on unspent funds if for some reason you sort of pull back on your campaign. We've seen that happen where people kind of decide maybe close to the election, they don't actually want the seat, but they're already on the ballot. Yeah, so <laughs> um, so you can also draft in um, a provision that would allow for, you know, whatever, I guess, appellate body 
um, to revoke the certification. So if you have somebody who qualified as a, um, a participating candidate and went ahead and got certified and then, you know, wasn't able to, um, I don't know, some way fulfill any of the requirements, that appellate body would have the option to revoke certification. And then at that point, um, that candidate would, um, they would have to return all the unspent funds within three days of that decision, and then also require all funds, uh, return all funds um, that were distributed to the candidate. And then you also could, you know, uh, have that candidate subject to a fine as well. So there are definitely, you know, provisions that you can build in again to address those scenarios. Thank you. Any other comments, questions at this time? So when we get together a couple of weeks from now, it sounds like we'll be looking at two draft ordinances as starting points. Um, just looking at my notes here. We've given some feedback. Um, so you've got that to work with. I wanna look to the folks from Perkins Thompson and ask you, do you need anything else from us at this point to be ready for the workshop on the 27th? We have enough guidance. Okay. And, uh, want to adjust some of the numbers going forward, but okay. Okay, I'm looking at Zoom. I'm looking at my colleagues around the dais. I, I think everybody's. I think we're good for now. So I want to say thank you so much again to the folks who came for public comment. Um, to you all from Perkins Thompson for being here with us tonight and for helping us with this body of work. And of course, to my colleagues on the council for engaging in this as well as city staff. So with that, our workshop, it is 7 through 7 28. Our workshop number two is adjourned. Thanks. I don't really need the gavel, do I? <laughs>